Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are joining us from. My name is Robert Bell, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the five hidden truths about network deployment, the first in a series of webinars uh, that we're calling the Broadband Agendas that ICF is presenting. We've just finished a whole series called the Innovation Agendas, and we're moving through uh, key topics in this very important work that we're doing together. I'm one of the co-founders of the Intelligent Community Forum, where my job is <clears throat> data analytics. Um, I also do most of the uh, production of the books and reports we put out and lead our Intelligent Community Master Class and Community Accelerator programs that I'll tell you more about in just a moment. If you're not terribly familiar with us, the Intelligent Community Forum is two things. We are a global network of cities, of metro areas, and counties that we have recognized as something called intelligent communities. And that network exists so that the members of it, these communities in different places around the world of many different sizes in terms of population, can collaborate on economic and social development projects and quite simply learn from each other in an ongoing fashion. We're also, however, a think tank. We study this network um, to see how intelligent communities are using information and communications technologies to build economic prosperity, to solve social challenges, and to enrich their cultures. We're best known, I think, for our Intelligent Community Awards program, which from the outside looks like a, a typical awards program. We have um, semi-finalists and finalists and, and a, an honoree at the end. But for us, it's actually a research program. It is from the opportunity to, uh, to win an award. Uh, that these communities are motivated to submit data to us, which in turn we turn into best practices and lessons that communities around the world can take advantage of. And we deliver those in a number of ways, including our Community Accelerator Education Program, which consists of presentations, workshops, uh, metric analysis, and mentoring that we provide to communities in uh, really in many, many different places. We publish as well both reports and books, which are available on our website as well as at Amazon.com. We've had success in creating a set of institutes for the study of the intelligent community because this is frankly a topic so big that we can never get to all the most important parts of it. And the important part about these institutes is that they are local. They are taking the global framework that we've created and finding its application in the local areas uh, that they serve as well as serving at, for us as hubs of, of knowledge about the intelligent community that helps unite our network. Every year, uh, we put on an event uh, called the Summit, and in 2018, we'll be in, we'll across the uh, Atlantic in London on June 5 and 7, bringing together the leaders of intelligent communities from many different nations uh, and exploring with them and through them how this very important work is done for the benefit of the places called home. And finally, we've uh, established so far two ICF nations, one in Canada and one in Taiwan, and these are organizations of a number of intelligent communities in those nations who want to work together on national level problems, be it regulation, uh, be it economic development policy, so that they can help that whole nation punch above its weight in the world. <clears throat> there are about 160 cities and metropolitan areas and counties around the world in our network. Um, they're on all five continents. And unusually, they have populations ranging from 10,000 up to 12 million. Um, of course, size in, in a city or county does matter, but we believe uh, that the, the resources you have to bring on the pro bear on a problem are much less important than the ways in which you will go about attacking it and the, way, the, the intelligence with which you apply those resources to get the job done. In an age of digital disruption, which I think everybody would agree we are living through, it's probably one of the biggest uh, technology changes certainly in the last 50 or 60 years, perhaps 100 years, um, and it's causing, for all of the marvelous innovation taking place, it's causing a great deal of disruption in the economy, in jobs, in work, in uh, social status that people have, uh, in the functioning of society and in the functioning of culture. And in that age of digital disruption, intelligent communities are the ones who are using the same digital technologies, the same tools that are so disruptive, and turning them to their advantage, using them to build inclusive prosperity, using them to solve social problems, and to enrich and, in many cases, export their cultures to other places. 
Um, so it's work that we're privileged to have uh, begun, but also privileged to see every day uh, amazing examples of it. So that's enough about, about us. Uh, on to the business of our webinar today. Our agenda's uh, got three parts. I'm going to speak briefly about the models we have seen for municipal broadband deployment, and I'm using municipal in the largest sense there. It may mean a city, it may mean a county, it may mean a metropolitan area consisting of several municipalities or and a county government that have all chosen to work together. Uh, then next we're going to hear from a real expert on the topic of broadband, and he's going to share with us the five hidden truths of network deployment. And uh, I've heard him talk about this in the past, and I can assure you that it's going to be extremely thought-provoking. And then finally, we'll end up with questions and answers on this. And a note on that, um, during this webinar, all of you uh, will be on in listen-only mode, but we very much want to entertain your questions and bring them into the discussion. So if you look at your control panel, you'll find a section called questions. And you can simply go in and write anything in there. It will get to me. And as we get to the Q&A part of our discussion, I'll be sure to work your questions in because it's what you need. It's, uh, our job here is to make sure that you walk away having learned the things that you need to know. Following this webinar, the recording will be available on ICF's website, um, and so you can certainly recommend that to others if you think it's content that you'd like to share. And finally, if you need any technical support during the call, you might just jot down these two numbers here. One is a toll-free for the U.S., and the other, of course, is for outside the U.S. Uh, we've never yet had any technical problems that I'm aware of, but it's always good to have some backup there. Okay, broadband models. Um, Intelligent communities very often have to take action in the area of broadband deployment. We all know what ultimately we want. We want broadband to be available pretty much everywhere in that community, that, that city, that county, that metro area. We want it to be extremely reliable. We want it to be very fast so that we can do anything from surfing the web and sending email to originating, originating our own YouTube channel right from our home or our, our business. Uh, so it's got to be fast, it's got to be capable, and it also needs to be extremely cost competitive. Um, so where the private sector is doing a good job at meeting all of those goals, then great, no problem, let's get on to the next challenge. But we find in, in many, many intelligent communities that's not the case. And so they decide that they need to take some action to make sure that their employers, their educators, their healthcare providers, their government, their nonprofits, and their residents have access to this incredibly important uh, resource for the development of their community. So how do they go about it? Well, there are five different approaches that we have seen communities take over the past 15 years. And they, they range from uh, uh, strategies that are very traditional, that use the conventional, well-accepted powers of government to accomplish goals, all the way up to extremely controversial uh, and aggressive strategies that some communities have taken. And so I think it's, it's worthwhile knowing that there's a continuum here uh, of ways to go about this and ways to go about dealing with the business model problems. So the least controversial, the most traditional approach is really just to go to the policy toolkit that all governments have and look at the issues of land use and look at the issues of the assets we have and to see how they can be used better to encourage broadband deployment by private, private sector telecom carriers, by integrators, by property owners. So those, uh, some examples of those are um, you see communities mapping their existing broadband networks, mapping their conduit networks or pole networks to identify gaps and opportunities. And then when they sit down with uh, private sector carriers, particularly around licensing, they've got a whole lot of great information to bring that to that discussion. And they can say, hey, we've got real infill problems. We've got gaps that need to be filled here. What are you going to do about it? Um, and so that, that becomes powerful. Uh, very often they work on improving their own access policies for their poll, the government-owned polls and conduits. Uh, it's not uncommon for governments to discover that their motivation to generate revenue from those things is at odds with creating a good environment for private sector carriers to deploy. You know, they're charging too much. And so they work that problem and decide how to get an, a reasonable rate of return and yet encourage competitive deployment. They sometimes require the installation of conduit whenever they dig up the street. There's just a simple policy change. If we're going to dig up a street to do something, we're going to lay down uh, plastic conduit. 
which over time, as those conduit pieces of conduit are connected, becomes an extremely valuable resource for a telecommunications carrier that wants to run fiber or coaxial cable through it much, much cheaper um, than, than digging up the street again. Some 80% of, of all costs for deploying a network are the civil works, as they're called, the digging up the street, uh, putting up the wires. And then finally, one of the more interesting things that some communities have done is to change their building codes. They've said, if you're going to put up a new development or you're going to redevelop uh, some a building 50% or more, you have to make it broadband ready. And that broadband readiness has to be throughout the facility and then run to a demarcation point on the street, on the road, so that a private sector carrier can connect to you. Uh, and in, particularly in communities where there's a lot of new property development going on, this has been very powerful in creating a, a completely, a, a real uh, exceptional area of broadband connectivity that in turn tends to drive competition in other areas. So policy alone uh, is slow, it takes time, but it does accomplish the goals. Uh, but in other places, they, they, they want to step up a little bit. So, in most jurisdictions, governments can build and operate networks to serve their own facilities. Um, it's a very easy uh, investment to justify because it replaces an existing cost, the monthly telecom bill. Uh, typically, uh, from anecdotally, I've been told you can expect payoff in less than five years from this. So it's a very, very safe investment. You know you're going to use it. And once you have that government-owned network in place, you can do interesting things like deploy free Wi-Fi in public locations that rides on the network. You can uh, you become encouraged to develop online constituent services that are going to tend to increase user demand for broadband. And the most interesting thing about this to me is the psychology. It changes the uh, how private sector carriers tend to view the costs and benefits of investing or not investing in broadband for the community. If the government's at the table suddenly spending money on this thing, it creates a, an environment which is harder for the private sector to sit there and say, well, this, you know, you, you, what you've got is fine. Um, the third, and again, we're stepping up the levels of, uh, if you will, of challenge, of risk for the community, um, is some communities step up and create public infrastructure. Now, that shouldn't be controversial, and building infrastructure is what what governments do. Uh, in this case, however, it's telecommunications infrastructure, and so that's perhaps a bit different from our, our usual definitions. And what happens in this case is that local governments build what are called dark telecommunications assets. Dark meaning the opposite of lit. When you're thinking about optical fiber which travels by light, so you're talking about an empty, an empty fiber optic you know, uh, cable. You're talking about a coaxial cable which doesn't have any service on it right now. And so they will build conduit networks. They will build optical or coaxial fiber networks, uh, coaxial cable networks. They will build wireless towers and, and hook them up. Um, and then they market this infrastructure to the private sector as well as to businesses that have major communications needs. Those buyers then install the equipment, activate the circuits, deliver the services. Um, they are leasing those assets from the government, so they make lease payments. And those typically are, are structured to cover the capital, the maintenance, and the upgrade costs of the network. So really, everybody wins. The community gets better service. Carriers get a less risky proposition because their costs are lower when they deploy service. And the government has lease uh, revenues to help pay its costs. And the advantage for many communities about this is that it steers clear of concerns about government competing with the private sector because it's not competing with the private sector. It's creating infrastructure that's available to all who want to hook up to it. Uh, the private sector doesn't always view it that way, but that is, in fact, what's happening. Stepping up the, uh, the, the level of competition, if you will, really, is to go to the next thing, and this is a strategy called open access. And in this case, um, the, the government body, or very often a public-private partnership, goes one step further. They actually activate the network. They light the fiber, they switch on the coaxial cable network, um, they, they do other things in the wireless sphere. And the idea here is that they're providing what is called in, in telecommunications the transport level, the most basic level of you can get a signal from here to there. They, however, what they then do is to turn around and say to service providers, gee, here's the transport level. All you've got to do is now deliver your services over it. And so those, those competitive carriers come in and hook up at each end of the network, and they're in business. And this is valuable because it even further reduces the costs and risks to the private sector of coming into, the, into that market. 
and vastly create, uh, increases the competitive uh, the, the degree of competition in that market in most cases, sometimes from you know, a factor of two or three competitors to a factor of dozens or even a hundred competitors in a marketplace because it's so inexpensive to start up service. And, and carriers can start up on a small scale and grow it as they have revenue against it. Again, the government leases that ad access and therefore can make a business case. And finally, um, the, most, the most aggressive, the most challenging approach, the most extreme approach, is when government decides to compete directly with the private sector. And this typically happens only when they just cannot get telephone and cable and ISP incumbents to collaborate at all, to talk to them, to, to make a reasonable offer of any kind. It's a, a very typical problem in low density areas such as rural communities where it's, harder, it's just hard for anybody to make the business case um, to, to deploy service. And yet there is definitely a business and economic case for the community, for the government, in terms of economic development to see a network built. And in those cases, they go ahead and do that. Interestingly enough, those low-density communities often have a hidden advantage, which is, this is, and this is true in North America in particular, but it's true of other places as well, they already operate municipally owned electric um, power networks. And the reason that they do that is because in an earlier generation, 50, 60, 100 years ago, they also couldn't get the private sector to bring them electricity. So they invested it themselves and they, they, they electrified their communities. Well, this is simply an extension of the same thing. They're saying, fine, we'll, we'll run on our own, you know, through our own conduits, on our own poles, we'll, we'll run the network and deliver service in a of a different kind. So very, very challenging, very difficult. No community that's done it has ever had an easy time doing it, but you get the results ultimately in the end that you need, which is economic growth and a better quality of life for residents, for businesses, and for institutions. So that is our view at ICF of the models that you can expect to see out there. And you may find the experience in your community is very much like one of these, or you may have other, other things to share with us, which I hope you'll be doing through our question panel. It's now my pleasure, however, to, speak, uh, to introduce a gentleman who can speak to this uh, issue in great depth. And he's going to offer you his five hidden truths of network deployment. His name is Rob McCann. He's the founder and president of Clear Cable Networks. Now, Rob has, I've known him for a while. He's been working with advanced broadband service deployments in mid-market and rural cable and telecom systems since 1998. Um, he knows a lot about building and maintaining technology, networks, and application intelligence. And he gets that from working with carriers, with cable systems, municipalities, and network service providers in the Canada, the US, and other parts of the world, uh, providing them with technology, integration, and business practices. Uh, and so what he's got is a great deal of practical experience with traditional information technology and service networks, as well as a, a really clear view about what's ahead and a unique perspective on matching the technologies that are emerging right now with sound business practices to make sure that when you do make any kind of investment, whether it's of uh, time and energy into policy or whether it's in building your own network, you're making the sound choices. So Rob, welcome uh, to our webinar. I look forward very much to hearing what you have to say and over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Robert. I appreciate the introduction and thank you to all of you who are joining us today from all the different locations. Again, my name is Rob McCann and I'm gonna talk to you about the five hidden truths of networking. For those of you who happen to be uh, network engineers, you're gonna find the information we're gonna discuss today is not a surprise. In fact, it's not new, but it is factual, and I hope that it provides some value as you think about building out networks. As I start, I'd just like to point out that the reason you really care about what I have to say today is that I've been working in networking and internet for, uh, well, since 1990, and specifically, as Robert pointed out, helping mid-market cable, telephone, and municipal operators tackle their technical challenges since 1998, which represents a huge growth period, of course, in broadband and networking. And in 2010, our operation here in Canada was the Canadian Cable System Alliance Supplier of the Year. In 2015, because of the growing interest for municipal networks, we joined the Intelligent Community Forum Canada. And in 2016, we were named the Canadian Independent Telephone Association. 
Most importantly, though, I frequently spend time contributing to various industry publications, the Canadian Cable System Alliance, the Canadian Independent Telephone Association, but in North America, the National Cable Telephone Cooperative, and in both North America and Benelux, the uh, Society of Cable Television Engineers, and of course, the, the regulator here in Canada. Moreover, though, what I think the value I'll bring to you today is that my job at Clear Cable is to pay attention to the industry trends that are affecting broadband service providers everywhere. At the end of last year, the Intelligent Community Forum Canada issued this paper, The Broadband is the Essential Utility. And the paper calls out that broadband is just as important to economic development as clean water, reliable power, and good roads and transportation. And that's because broadband is the great enabler. It allows us to build a knowledge workforce and allows us to drive innovation. In fact, it is also a creator of jobs. The paper calls out and recommends that uh, broadband should be a universal right, a service that everyone has access to. And when this was released at the end of last year, interestingly, the Canadian uh, regulator decided to announce a universal service objective. So I encourage you to download and read that paper. Also at the most recent ICF uh, annual general meeting, uh, a mandate was adopted that broadband should be a basic right. So assuming the reason you're all here today is because you agree with that concept and you're trying to build networks, but building networks is not always simple. There are some caveats, some hidden truths that you need to be aware of. And rather than hold you hostage, I'm just going to give them all to you right now at the front, and then we'll talk about each one individually. First of all, the network is oversubscribed. And what I mean by that is that the service offered to the subscribers of a network greatly exceeds the capacity of a network if all of the subscribers were to want to use it at the exact same time. The network is always oversubscribed. Second, the network is not symmetrical. And what I mean by that is that there is more capacity to send information to subscribers, we call that the downstream, than there is for subscribers to send into the network, we call that the upstream. And the network is not symmetrical. Further, Consumption of network resources currently grows at a compound annual growth rate that exceeds 50%. Fourth, having more peers is better than having bigger peers. Peers are other networks that you might be related to. They could be networks that you connect to to get connected to the internet, or they could be other communities or other service providers near you. Having more of them is better than having bigger ones. And lastly, building a network is not just about building it, it's about operating it, and operating costs are the most important aspect. So those are the five truths. Let's move ourselves along. Around the beginning of the internet, we had these two types of architectures uh, for mass scale deployment of, of ISP services. You either fell into the top camp, which is a telco type deployment, which may be DSL, for instance, where individual copper wires would go to each house. And you might also have a cable type infrastructure where one coaxial cable goes from the head end and services a whole group of houses. And of course, in the 1990s, this caused a great war between the telcos and the cable cos to say that the telco network is not shared you have your own line, your own connection. But the reality, as we know, is that they both connect up to the internet and the internet is shared. Now, certainly, as time continued on, technology evolves, the same picture somewhat applies. We could have fiber architectures that are built in exactly the same different ways. But regardless of the actual underlying technology, at some point, we reach a location where the network is shared. It's the whole purpose of having an inter-network, connecting each and everyone together. Now, not everyone is consuming the network at the same time, and that's why we can oversubscribe. 
provisioning services to the fullest capacity for each individual subscriber would be a huge capital challenge. It would be very, very expensive. But because people are not all using the internet at precisely the same time, we can intermix that traffic together and allow sharing in such a way as to be able to provide a consistent service for everyone. What's important is that you need to understand the demographics in a particular given area so that you can capacitize the network appropriately. For instance, we find in places where there is a college dorm, uh, usage is much higher than there is in, uh, in other locations. We find that uh, more affluent areas tend to have higher capacity and higher usage. And by understanding the demographics of your particular area, you can build the network in such a way that the oversubscription is well managed and is not impacting the individual subscribers. But I urge you also to think about both directions. That's important. Robert mentioned we send things out to the world. We might want to have our own YouTube channel, for instance. So not only do we download, but we also upload. And it turns out that oversubscription works similarly in both directions. So the important message is that you need to plan for growth so that you're managing that oversubscription. We turn our attention to growth for a minute. This graph here that I'm showing you is a one-year graph from the Toronto Internet Exchange. The Internet Exchange is a place where ISP networks connect to each other in order to send traffic uh, back and forth in a settlement-free kind of arrangement. There are Internet Exchanges all over the world, uh, and this one just happened to be one that was convenient for me to get, and I have the aggregate traffic over the past year. Any other exchanges that you look at will have a very similar pattern. If you look at this graph, you'll see that it constantly grows. No surprise, we expect growth in, in network uh, usage. But it turns out that in this graph, in 2016, the exchange had 175 gigabits of traffic. By 2017, it had 290 gigabits of traffic, which means a greater than 50% compound annual growth rate. Now I know you're thinking this is just a snapshot in time, perhaps this is an anomaly. It turns out that we have 15 years worth of data that follows this exact same pattern. And it turns out also that it's not just a phenomenon happening in one location. It doesn't matter about the demographics. It doesn't matter about the geography or the region. We're seeing the same 50% compound annual growth happening everywhere. So regardless of, uh, of where you are in the world, I'm certain that you will find the same type of thing happening. What that means is that whatever network you build today, in five years, the network is going to have to have seven and a half times the capacity that's already there. So you need to plan for that. And again, you need to plan for both directions, ensuring that you have that capacity because it turns out the growth is the same in both locations. Now, one additional caveat. In your region, you may see higher or you may see lower growth. Uh, and it may be significant at times. But in aggregate, over the long term, you will find that it maps out to 50%. Now, when we're thinking about the both directions, we start to talk about symmetry. Now, we certainly strive for symmetry. In fact, the broadband, the essential utility paper calls it out and says that networks should be symmetrical. I should be able to download as much as I can upload. And of course, this supports the vision for doing things like uh, home health care, collecting data and feeding it back up to the network. But the reality is that most technology to be able to deliver services is built in an asymmetric manner, meaning that the equipment that's put at the central office or at the head end has far greater capabilities to send out to all of the subscriber devices that are in the field than the subscriber devices have to be able to send back up to the head end or central office. This is largely driven by the fact that when we have one giant 
piece of expensive equipment that needs to be reliable, we can afford to have an expensive piece of equipment to do that. Well, when we're deploying devices in people's homes on scale, we need those devices to be low cost devices, which means they're more of a consumer grade. So we really see the investment on the hardware side uh, leading the notion that we use asymmetric networks. But the good news is that in reality, there are more things to download than there are to upload. There are more pieces of media in the internet that are of interest to subscribers than there are things that subscribers have that are of interest to the rest of the world. And yes, we can all imagine a day when we have all sorts of big data from our intelligent house collecting all sorts of information about us and uploading it to the network. But the reality is that as those technologies emerge and grow, the things that are on the internet that are of interest to subscribers also continues to emerge and grow. In fact, the largest consumer of internet capacity today turns out to be video. Exceeding 75% in most markets is video. So video is also in the middle of a evolution going from uh, regular HD to ultra HD and eventually to 8K video, which means there's more capacity that's required in order to support that. So the reality is going to be for a long time that download is more important than upload, which plays very well into the asymmetric network. Now, there are two wild cards though in all of this, and that is the applications known as Twitch and Periscope and other ones that would be similar to that. These types of applications put the capability for individual subscribers to be able to be streaming video from their personal self up to the greater world. And, and that could drive larger upload capacity. So we need to keep those in mind. Instead of really focusing on the symmetry and the oversubscription, instead we like to think about minimizing latency in the network. So in other words, making the network perform better and faster. And that happens through peering. Peering is a very simple concept. It's networks that connect to each other to exchange and share traffic. The internet is comprised of what we call tier one service providers. And the tier one service providers are the folks that don't buy internet. They are the internet, or they have access to the entire given internet region simply based on the peering that they do with each other. And the types of companies that we see that are tier one ISPs in different places of the world would include Tata, KPN, Singtel, uh, Level 3, Verizon, AT&T. So these large organizations, they connect to each other, they create the internet. And then when you and I would like to access the internet, we need to connect to an ISP. So I would have my own internet service provider, you would have your internet service provider, there may be other internet service providers, and all of these folks are connecting to the tier one ISPs. And what that means is that for you and I to exchange traffic or to send something, maybe as simple as an email to each other, it needs to go from me to my ISP to a tier one across an internet down to another tier one to your ISP and eventually to you. As your ISP gets more and more and more subscribers, they can simply increase the capacity to the tier one ISP. They can get bigger pipes or bigger connections. The bigger connections just allows more to get through. It doesn't necessarily make the whole process more efficient. What would be better would be actually connecting your ISP to my ISP. And that is the concept of peering because now I've shortened the entire route for information or traffic to get from me to you. And now it's not practical for every ISP to connect to every other ISP. So what we tend to see is a peering exchange introduced into the middle. And again, there are several internet exchanges around the world. The Amsterdam Internet Exchange is the largest. 
there's the Toronto Internet Exchange, there are several in the US, so all around the world. So ISPs then can connect to peering exchanges, which allow them to connect to each other. Not only does this increase the capacity or the amount of connectivity to the internet that the ISP has, but it also reduces latency by allowing folks to connect to each other. The value of peering is that more connections are better than bigger connections, that the route diversity that comes from this is equal to greater resilience, meaning I'm not reliable, I'm not, I'm not relying on that single connection to the internet, I have multiple paths. It allows me to have the shortest path to connect between different locations, and by peering, we offload and save costs. What I mean by that is if you're building, say, a municipal network and you're buying internet transit to connect uh, up to an ISP, but the neighboring municipality is doing exactly the same thing, then for traffic to flow between your communities, you're both paying for that connection. But if you simply choose to connect to each other, you reduce that overall transit cost because the traffic that goes between you now will go over the private peering connection. The last place that I want to stop today is on operational costs, because all too often we consider the capital expenditures of what we need to actually build out a network, and we forget that after we've built it, we actually need to operate it. And operating costs start first with installation. So I've bought all of the hardware, now I need to actually configure it, install it, and connect it. And even when I've managed to do all of that, I need to have the mechanism to provision and monitor subscribers. That may involve some type of tool or system in the back office. It may involve some team that is off doing that provisioning and monitoring, but we need to connect the people to the network to bring the value. And of course, even once we've connected people to the network, it won't stay the same, things will change. Subscribers will come and subscribers will go. So we need to be able to uh, have change management. And of course, over time, the hardware and equipment that's in our network will also need to be maintained and or replaced. And maintenance contracts on hardware can range anywhere from 10 to 15% of the actual original hardware cost per year. And lastly, when we have all of these things together, we still need people. People are the biggest asset in the network. They're also the biggest expense in the network because we need to have them doing the installations, the provisioning, the change management, and maintaining the network. All of this means that you can count on operating costs easily exceeding 20% of your capital investment each year. In fact, a good example in 2010, the FCC looked at building a public safety broadband network all across the United States. The capital expenditure to build that network was estimated at $6.5 billion, but the annual operating costs were $1.3 billion. And this would be similar. You'll find that your original investment will have equal operating costs over a five-year period. So let's pull things back and summarize where we're at. First of all, don't fear oversubscription. Just manage it. The network is oversubscribed. It's the only cost-effective way to deliver services. You just need to be aware of your demographics and manage that growth. Strive for symmetry as best you can, because symmetry certainly has value, but accept the best that you can get to, because naturally the equipment tends to be asymmetric, and the applications that are needed today and for the foreseeable future will demand more in the downstream direction anyway. But be prepared for that 50% compound annual growth in consumption. Again, it's a rule that has played out in different geographies for more than 15 years. And as you do that, build more peering connections, interconnect with each other. Lastly, don't forget the operating costs. They are going to make or break your network and invest in your people. Thank you for your time today, and I will now turn it back to the floor for questions.
Okay, well, this is the floor speaking. Um, thank you very much, Rob. Let me click this little thing here and show people your smiling face. Listen, thank you very much. Um, I, this is just very, uh, concept, uh, this is content of exceptional value because it takes a lot of very complicated technical things and turns it into some principles that I think are easy to follow. And so I really appreciate it. Uh, I've gotten some questions coming in from, from uh, our audience. Let me just take a quick look through some of them. Um, bum, bum, bum. Okay. Um, let me start with something that I wanted to talk about, which was public-private partnerships. Um, I mentioned it briefly when I was talking about broadband models. Um, sometimes these, you know, the kind of when municipalities or counties or metro areas seek to build a network, sometimes they go it alone. But more often, they they do do it through partnership. What's been your experience of that? Yeah, I, I absolutely 100% agree with the concept. Certainly over the last maybe few decades, uh, PPPs may have gotten a bit of a bad name. Uh, but the reality is that service providers who are in this business and perhaps are publicly traded, uh, they have an obligation to return to their shareholders. And some of the markets or the locations that we want them to go to are places that will not yield a sufficient return. So I think it's incumbent upon the municipality or the, or the local or regional government to assist in de-risking that investment by working together with those service providers. And, and more importantly, working with a service provider brings along a whole bunch of machinery for managing and operating and running uh, networks that municipalities may not have at their disposal. So you're right, there are two ways to do this. There is to build a service provider network, which is certainly a viable opportunity, or to partner with uh, another service provider. To your point earlier, some of the service providers today still see this as a competitive threat as opposed to a cooperative threat. But I think that as the networks continue to become increasingly important to the economic development of regions, uh, that will change. Yeah, that always interests me. I, a, one of our communities is in a rural area in Western Canada. <clears throat> I was having a discussion with them about a tower network they built, and they said it was just fascinating watching, well, it was annoying, but it was fascinating watching the very slow change in the mindset of some of the private sector carriers who are completely accustomed to building, owning, and operating all of the infrastructure, and then getting them to gradually say, well, you know, if I hang some radios on your tower, it's a better deal for me. <laughs> than if I build it myself. And so, you know, they see it's a very slow evolution and I think so much of it is just cultural mindset. It's what companies are used to doing. It's what they know works. Um, another question from our group, which I, th I thought of your, of your five hidden truths, uh, which do you think are the most typically misunderstood, or most typically um, overlooked, where, where, people, where people you're talking to say, oh my God, really? <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I think they all uh, tend to be a surprise to different <laughs> folks, but but certainly it's the, the ongoing operating costs. Uh, networks do not look after themselves. Things change. Uh, you know, the weather gets hot and it gets cold and wires fall or connections get cut. Uh, technology or equipment uh, goes out of date or it breaks down that there is, are a whole bunch of things that need to be done in order to operate and run the network. Uh, and that is probably the biggest area that gets overlooked. Yeah, sure. It's easy, it's easy to get the capital when you start out, but well, it's not easy, it's very hard, but at least it can be done. But uh, operating expenses can, be, can kill you if you're not looking after them. Uh, another interesting question here, um, asking about how municipally owned ISPs um, are adding or layering services for the citizens and the businesses, you know, what they're calling intelligent community value-added services on top of traditional internet. We're not just bringing you the internet, we're actually engaging as a, as a, a government to serve our constituents better. I certainly got a lot of stories about that, but Rob, is there anything that leaps to mind for you? Well, I think that the biggest one, uh, you know, comes right off of the, the ICF cycle, and, and that's digital equality. What we're seeing is that municipalities are taking the opportunity to build network capacity in places where a the market wouldn't go because the people uh, wouldn't have the amount of uptake 
but also where folks need access in order to participate in the local government in you know the, the digital economy so to speak so we're seeing you know Wi-Fi and parks and and access in libraries and those sorts of things and, and I think that it's important for the municipalities to make that available so that uh, citizens can have free and open access to the city hall's website to the library's website to the maybe the local medical center and, and all of the local resources that arguably are moving and migrating to an online environment where they might not otherwise have that access sure I mean and that's you know that's kind of fundamental but there's also just amazing example after example once as you said you know there's this compound annual growth in 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 the network well that's driven by the fact that once you have it you discover the amazing things you can do with it so in Melbourne uh, Victoria Australia which is our current intelligent community of the year they built an application called ask Izzy and ask Izzy is a solution to homelessness one of the, they, just, they did a bunch of research with their homeless population and discovered two things one is that most uh, homeless people actually have smartphones because it's become such an essential tool of living and that they also you know need services that they can't get so ask Izzy is basically a place you can go on as a homeless person you can find out what the current capacity at shelters around the you know the city um, where can I get health care services where can I get social services where can I get addiction treatment it's also got a place to store to, you can go into one of these shelters get some of your important documents scanned and stored in a vault online so again making it giving homeless people a leg up to help them get out of their situation through digital services um, the other side of that is business right I mean the business community is incredibly important wherever we are in a Taiwanese city I think is Taichung uh, Taiwan they again did some research and discovered they have a very large uh, small and medium-sized enterprise business sector who are all in the precision manufacturing in business in some way shape or form and they, they the, the problem they uncovered was that these companies all need to sell to a bunch of very big companies all of which have these very sophisticated software platforms called enterprise resource planning or ERP and so they were kind of being frozen out of, of opportunities so the city basically built and customized uh, bought and customized one of these ERP systems and provides it for shared use among these 1500 different manufacturers right none of them could afford to have it but together they can afford it so yeah once you have this network the things you can do are really almost limited almost by your imagination if you go to Tallinn Estonia and go into their their uh, online service for citizens you'll find that you've got access to over a hundred services everything from scheduling doctor's appointments to to buying stuff I mean, it's, it's it's simply unbelievable um, and I could go on and on but I don't want to get too too drowned down in that um, okay well this is a, this is a, here's a very specific question but it's worth asking from your experience in advising um, this is muni networks here that are going to you know, take the take the gamble of building a network in partnership or not what kind of subscription levels should the people undertaking that expect you know over the first few years of that network and I know that's a hard thing to say because it all depends but what's your experience yeah you're right it really does depend it depends entirely on the demographics of the market and the competitive landscape um, if you're you know if you're going to compete head-on with a service provider um, ignoring the fact that it may be a municipal entry uh, anytime a new service provider opens in a market we tend to see about 20 percent of the available consumers migrate over to the new <laughs> service provider um, that is that's that's fairly common but again, it's going to be really predicated on what that competitive environment looks like and and whether there's any access at all. So if you're moving into a market where there is no access today, then adoption will be strong. And, and it will also be dependent on where you are in the world. Sure. In Bristol, Virginia, they, they had one of those situations where they had a, a telephone company and a cable company, but the service was very poor. And so they they made the difficult decision to leap into the marketplace, and they worked really hard. They they turned it into a community crusade basically. So when they went live, within a couple of years they had 80% of the market. You know, but again that's because they had turned it into something that became something it became a project the entire community cared about. 
and, and that made a huge difference. So I think it, that is very, very important. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, your issue around asymmetry, symmetry and asymmetry. I, I have colleagues who treat symmetry in a network as being tantamount to, to a, uh, a religious uh, requirement. It has to be or we're all going to, it's never going to work. Um, and yet I, I think that my, my observation is that they're kind of missing what they call in the insurance business the law of large numbers. You know, yes, if everybody is on, is on a health care, a remote health care application at the same time, you need symmetry, but when does that happen? Is that, would you agree with me? I absolutely agree with you, and it really does come down to we could technically build symmetrical networks, right? We could run uh, individual fibers from every, from a central office or head end to every individual home, and we could connect them with technology that has the same speeds in the upload and the download. Uh, the reality is they're just not going to use it. Uh, they will download more than they will upload without a doubt. Uh, and the nature of the applications that we have will continue to grow at the same rate. So I expect that to stay the same. And to your point, once you have a large number of folks in a particular service area, you have a better uh, ability to multiplex those folks together and, and not have them perceive uh, an impact to service. So mm -hmm. I, I think that in order to be cost effective and in order to get the most people covered, it is perfectly acceptable to be asymmetrical. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an interesting question here that we don't, we're not going to really address, but I can give you an answer. It says, for the benefit of local governments and rural interests, is there a comprehensive assessment of broadband benefits you can recommend? Yeah, I think I'm going to send you to a place called the Strategic Networks Group. They do a great deal of analysis about what you can, what kind of return you can expect on a broadband investment. And what I like about them is that they're looking at it a return, not just in a business case return, but an economic return. What's the economic return to the community of investing in broadband? So that's strategic networks group. If you look them up online, you'll, you'll come to them. Of course, they're going to want to charge you money to do an assessment for you, but they also have a lot of good resource on their site that can get you started in understanding what the, the benefits of broadband are. And, and indeed, there, you know, there's residential benefits, obviously, but the business community is extremely important. I mentioned Bristol before. Um, one of the things, interesting challenges they came to when their network was so successful was that then they realized that they had a peering problem. Um, they realized that what they call the middle mile problem, but their problem was we're out in a, we're out in, in a very rural area in, uh, in southern Virginia, and our business community, you know, isn't getting the service. They, they can connect to the internet, but there just isn't enough peering to give them the robust service. So I'm wondering, Rob, and when you when you run into that, obviously you have because you keep emphasizing peering. What are, is, is the specific advice you offer to some of your clients to to help? to help you know get those relationships in place yeah well, well first and foremost networks will often go buy service from an ISP and they will be allocated addresses IP addresses whether that's version 4 or version 6 from their ISP that they then use in their own provision of service you know either for their business or their local business community or their subscribers and when they do that, they don't explicitly have control of those IP addresses and how those addresses are connected uh, to the internet. So one big recommendation we have is that companies approach the local internet registry in, in the United States, of course, in North America, that's the American Registry of Internet Numbers or the ARIN, and actually acquire their own autonomous system number in the internet and their own IP addresses, which then allows them to start to peer with other networks and allows them to control how they are connected and how they are routed to and from the internet. So that's the first step. Uh, the second step then is to uh, do whatever they can to get to a local peering point in their region. And that may involve leasing services from another service provider. It may involve building services to one of those peering exchanges. But once you find a peering exchange, it's relative, and you have your IP addresses, it's relatively easy to join that exchange and, and you know, change traffic with local folks. Thank you. 
The follow-up question about that your, your 20% mig uh, migration uh, statistic is that residential? Is that business? Is it both? Is, are they different? Yeah, I don't think we would have the you know the microscopic data to say for sure. I mean, that's really in general. We do see both uh, move because everyone loves to hate the incumbent. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, you know, my, my my anecdotal observation from visiting the communities I visited is that the, the strategic target has to be your business community. You know, if you can make sure your employers are all well served and that new employers coming into it are extremely well served, you're going to see an economic benefit a lot faster than you are by making sure that I can get Netflix in my home. Um, that's just sort of, you know, fundamental. Um, and it's also, I think, an easier target to hit because you don't have to spend as much money there when you get started. Uh, we're reaching, unfortunately, the end of our time here. Um, just, I want to just deal with one question that came in, which is how receptive are communities to embracing the intelligent community concept? That's a short question with a very long answer. And the long answer is, the short version of that long answer is that it's all over the map. I mean, every day we deal with communities that are extremely sophisticated, and they tend to appear in our, our Smart 21 and our top seven in our intelligent community of the year positions, but we're also constantly meeting communities where they're just getting started. Um, the good news, I think, is that, that there is an increasing awareness among community leaders of places of all size that there is something fundamentally going on in the world that they've got to get in front of if their community is not going to be left behind. And I, I find that true in, in, in medium-sized cities, big cities, uh, and in rural communities in other places. And Rob, I'm just curious, would you, would you agree with that perception? Because you, you certainly cover a lot of, a lot of ground in, in your, your travels. I am absolutely in agreement with you. Okay. Well, as I say, there's much more we could talk about, um, but unfortunately we've reached the end of our hour. I just want to thank you, Rob, and, and finish with a couple of, of, uh, of closing thoughts for our, our audience here. Uh, first of all, we do a lot of this kind of work. So webinars is something we do. We also put out best practice reports based on that, that tell about the, um, the achievements of some of the specific communities we do in the areas of um, knowledge, the knowledge workforce, education, the areas of uh, innovation and local government services. Coming up uh, very soon, we'll be publishing a new report, which is titled Building the Innovation Ecosystem, how you can actually set yourself up to become a startup-driven, knowledge-driven, innovation-driven economy from, you know, really the ground up. Uh, this content is available for free to the members of ICF on our website. It's also available for purchase to non-members. Um, briefly, coming events, coming events, we've got a lot coming up. September 13 is the deadline for our uh, annual awards process. Um, there's nomination forms on our website. We have a lot of, uh, <laughs> many, many communities are beginning to turn those in already, so we're looking forward to a robust competition this year. And again, the point of that competition, of course, is to win, but more importantly, is to help advance the, the understanding we've developed around this topic. On October 27th, we will announce the semifinalists in that award process, the Smart 21 Communities of the Year. That'll take place, actually, we're doing that live in, uh, Har at, uh, in Harlem, New York, in New York City, uh, as, as well as online at the same time. In February, in February of 2018, date not quite picked yet, we will be announcing the finalists, the top seven intelligent communities, including that group of Smart of 21 and bringing, bringing them down to seven. Then on June 5 and 7 in London, we'll be holding our next annual summit, uh, Summit 18, uh, where we'll be, it'll be the, the first summit we've actually held outside of the United States. We're extremely excited. There's a lot of great examples in Britain to learn from, uh, and we hope that you'll put that into your calendars and consider showing up in that beautiful aisle. On June 7th, the last day of that, we will announce our Intelligent Community of the Year, as we always do. It will be the community that will take over from Melbourne in Victoria, state of Victoria in Australia. And finally, in June 18, something new. Um, we're going to, based on the data we've gathered over the last few years in particular, we're going to publish our first annual ranking, the world's top 100 intelligent communities, based on very specific scoring data that we've amassed. And uh, we're going to publish that immediately after the announcement of the, of the Intelligent Community of the Year, based on all the data that we will have received between now and, uh, and that time. So I highly recommend if you, if you, that you go to our website, you download the questionnaire, you complete that, and turn it into us. If you do, you will receive uh, immediately what we call an index report, which will show you how you compare to our global data set. It's good information on strengths, weaknesses, and, and opportunities. 
uh, we'll also put you in the running for this particular list. And if you get it to us before September 13, you'll also be in the running for this year's Intelligent Community of the Year. So all good things to keep in mind. That is the end of our webinar. I thank you so much for joining us. Our next broadband um, agendas webinar will be at the end of September. You'll be seeing some information about that coming out soon. And I uh, look forward very much to having you join us then. Thanks so much. Oh, one last thing I should say before you all hang up. Um, I should say it again, recording of this webinar will be available next week on our website. It's, we post it to the pay, this, this event page. So the, uh, the, the, the means by which you registered originally, if you go back that way, you will find uh, a place where you can actually see this webinar and share it with your colleagues. Thank you so much. <laughs>